Hey guys, welcome. This is season two, episode one of Gripped, Awakening the Grown in a Generation for Revival and the Return of the Lord. I'm Billy Humphrey, and this is my good friend. Corey Russell. Come on. You can see we've upgraded. If you're listening <laughs> to us, you got to check it out on YouTube because we've upgraded our studio for season two. And we are really, I think this season, going to get into something that is so dear, so deep for both of us. I mean, last season we did the whole season on revival. Yes. And this really is is what revival is this season. It's the knowledge of God. That's right. So the whole season we're going to talk about the depth of knowing God, the beauty of Jesus, the glory of his name, all these things that go into who is God because really what revival is, it's widespread revelation. That's exactly right. And so I was thinking the way to start this season off, it's one of the stories that really, for me, was life-changing, and it's how God used you to change my life, honestly. And uh, wow. it was 2004. Was it? No, no. 2003. We're in, I, I've just moved to Kansas City. Yes. And do you remember at that time, um, they had the house churches. Yes. Uh, I hop Casey yes. had all these different house churches and you were a house church pastor. <laughs> and the, well, this is the crazy thing is that I remember, I remember old Katie Bennett. Now Katie Reed was my worship yes, leader. Yes. And I would literally, I was preaching Romans eight every week. Awaken the groan. Yes, Awaken. That's right. And I didn't know what else to say, but I just get up there and just groan. <laughs> so, so I remember we're in, we're in this house church and the house churches were different ones. I remember, uh, Misty Edwards' parents, they had such a sweet house oh, church. Yeah. They were serving meals, and people were people were like getting loved up. Well, in your house church, it was just fire. You just open. We'd worship, and then you just open up the Bible and just tear it up. And um, But I remember that season, you everything you preached was on the knowledge of God. Yes. And I remember I'd never heard anybody unpack Job 36. And uh, Job thirty six twenty six, you're you're the one that God used to mark me with that verse, and it says this: Behold, our God is great, and we do not know Him. Yeah. Nor can the number of His years be recounted. Yes. And there was something about that in those days. You were carrying, and you still do, but you were carrying something so deep about the knowledge of God. And I just remember listening to you thinking, man, I wish he would just break that down, man. And then you say another thing, man, could you just break that down? And it was marking me so deeply. So I thought it'd be fun to start this season <laughs> talking about Job 36. Yeah, I uh, and actually Dana, my wife, did an amazing song on that. You know, behold, God is great and we do not know him. Yeah. Who is this who stretches out the heavens like a curtain? And I, I think, I think, how the Lord would really the it's Lord Isaiah 40 yeah Isaiah 40 Job Job 36 it's when God gets into question mode <laughs> it's when the questions start coming up because the questions when God is asking questions it's an interrogation when he begins to expose all the futility the vanity the the cheapness by which we talk and God just lays everyone bare with do you know who I am yeah you talk about me, you'll use Bible verses, but do you have a clue who I am? I, I got really gripped with uh, the knowledge of God. I mean, books, and we're always going to throw books out to you guys. Knowledge of the Holy yeah. by A.W. Tozier is just a, it's a must. Yes. Yeah. It, and his books on his book on attributes, yes. attributes of God. And in the very first bit of it, the preface or the first chapter, it's why we must think rightly about God and coming into right views of God. But I remember the Job 36, this is what it hit in me, is that the first doorway into the knowledge of God, because we're going to use that phrase a lot, the knowledge of God. What does it mean to not to know God? I know truths about God. I can know someone's name. I can even know sports stars on on, on television. I'm manifesting just <laughs> I'm like <laughs> hit, just even thinking, keep going. But we can know, and I, I, I think this is really the core of this, mm. because we're digging down into that word of knowing. And the knowledge of God, it's something that passes mental assent or being able to affirm things just true about God. But the knowledge of God we're talking about 
is an experiential knowledge. Yes. Now, I, I, it begins and it, it informs our minds. It's clarified in the mind, but it's ultimately it begins right here. When the when when you begin to encounter who God is deep in your spirit, yeah. it's a spiritual knowledge. Yes, it's a spiritual. Like a, the phrase that always gets me, Ephesians three, Paul prayed that you would know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Yes. How do you know something that goes past, you know, your your mental apprehension? It's an encounter, and so the Job thirty six twenty six, and we're just going to stay there with it. Yeah. Behold, God is great, and we do not know Him. That right there is the doorway into the true knowledge of God. I remember you're 26 years old, and you're basically just, there's 40 of us gathered, and we're all IHoppers. We're all in the prayer room, you know, 25 hours a week, and you're basically just yelling at us, we don't know God. (laughs) That's exactly. And and I'm brand new in Kansas City, so I've been in ministry at this point 13 years, and I'm thinking— this guy is so, he's just crazy. Like, why is he, I know God, like I'm yeah. saved. And that was the problem was I didn't know my own barrenness. Yes. And what I had uh. done was I had equated salvation, having met Jesus with knowing uh. the depths and the riches of him. And I had assumed because I'd met him, I, I, I you know, grasped everything there was of him. And I had... I had not recognized my own lack in this one, in, in, in co- comprehending this one who's infinite. And therein is the problem that people, the church especially, I think, we think we know God. We think we know all of his ways, everything he's about, what he's like, what he likes. We assume too much. Yes. And, and we don't actually know what he's into. Yes. We don't know what he cares about. I heard uh, just recently um, a prophetic man, um, one, I won't say his name, everybody would know him, and he was talking uh, around the elections just recently, and he went to heaven. He had these encounters where he went and sat in his chair, and he went up to heaven. For two weeks straight, he was going up to heaven, and what's interesting is this guy, he he would talk a lot about politics just normally, Uh But he said when he started having these encounters, he was having face-to-face encounters with Jesus. Jesus wasn't talking about anything that we were talking about down here. He wasn't talking about the American elections. He wasn't talking about the president or, you know, the the former vice president. He wasn't talking about anybody. He was talking about his return, his glory, his kingdom, and the necessity for a revival in uh, the United States. And he said, well, what about America? Aren't you interested? And he said, the prescription for America is the same. If my people wow. who are called by my name, by my name, will humble themselves. If my people will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear and I'll heal. And I just realized this, man. We, we think we know him. We assume too much and what he's interested in, what he's like. So often it's not it's nothing that we're even in tune with. Yeah, I think it's Psalm 50 that says, you thought I was altogether like oh. you. <laughs> that just came to me. I think it's Psalm 50. <gasps> you thought I was altogether like you. And uh, I this is the doorway. And that's why we want to take our time here at the beginning in this first uh, episode is your doorway. And I even think, I, I believe, I've heard it said many times, I believe it personally. We are in a Laodicean spirit yeah. in, in the Church of America, the Church in the Earth, and the and the core issue about Laodicea. Most of us go, "Oh my goodness, Laodicea!" <laughs> the core, <laughs> like that's so intense. The core issue to me about Laodicea is this: Jesus says, "You're this, but you thought you, you were thought. this." Jesus doesn't rebuke them for being blind. Yeah. He rebukes them because they don't know they're blind. They don't know they're blind. And, and I believe that this is a key thing right here. The currency to get eye salve is the awareness you don't see like you thought you saw. Yes. That's currency. The currency, it's called humility. Yes. It's called reality. And God's great gift to you. It takes God to know God. So we need first God to show us and to crack our religious uh, uh little ideas we have about him because this is something you know there's we're just going to give you the table yes, of contents now. here we go Re- religion and revelation they'll both say the same words <laughs> they'll both say the same words the the religious spirit is happy they know it 
The spirit of revelation realizes they're in a paddle boat and they're at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning yes. of encountering this truth. And they'll be spending forever getting fresh, mind-blowing discoveries of who God is, yes. of what God's like, of how God feels, of who we are to him, of his ways, of his leadership. So we need God to show us where we're currently at. And you never graduate from that. You never graduate from it. That's the thing that Elihu brings out, right? So here's, here, let's just lay this out. Yeah. So the book of Job, you, you, we kind of focus on chapter one and chapter two where Job's getting nuked and all these negative things are happening. And we just kind of like, okay, I'm done. We don't read. I'm tapping out. We don't read anymore. Well, well, here's what happens. For the next 34 chapters, you have this conversation between Job and his three friends. And they're going back and forth. And essentially, Job is justifying himself why he doesn't deserve what's happened. Yes. And his three friends are all saying, you obviously deserve it because this doesn't happen to somebody who's righteous. That's right. And so there's this back and forth. And Job, he crosses a line. Now, his friends cross a line, too. Job crosses a line by saying, if God would show up, I will justify myself to him. I'll tell him why I don't deserve this why I'm righteous, if God would show up. And his friends, they, they say, no, you're clearly unrighteous and you don't know why God's doing this. And clearly you're in sin. Yes. And so they're crossing a line. They're speaking on God's behalf. Yes. And Job's crossed the line and he's accusing God. Yes. And then Elihu shows up, chapter 36, this young man. <laughs> and he's sitting there watching this thing. And what does he do? Break it down, Corey. He drops, I mean, you, you share it. I, I just, he drops the word of the Lord. He says, he basically says, I've listened to this long enough, and I'm now going to speak on behalf. I have the word of the Lord. Yes. And he begins to declare the right knowledge of God. And then he hits this exclamation point in verse 26. He says, our God is great, and we do not know him. You don't know him, Job. You don't know him, Job's friends. We do not know him. He goes, let me prove it to you. You, don't, you couldn't even tell us when his birthday was. He's from forever. Yes. And he begins to expound the right knowledge of God. Now, here's the wild thing. He describes how when God speaks, he thunders with his majestic voice. Yes. And what God does there is this prophetic picture of when you have a messenger who speaks the right knowledge of God. Elihu speaks the message and said, God thunders. And then what happens? God shows up and thunders. That's right, Job 37. And it's so, I remember the first time I heard you preach that, it offended me. Yeah. That you would point a finger at me and say, you don't know God. And I, I'm telling you, it was the, it, honestly, it's one of the greatest gifts anyone's ever given me. Because mm. it put me on a journey that I thought I'd already arrived at the destination. In other words, I was, I'd been saved. I'd been in ministry 13 years. I'd been saved like, you know, 17 years or something. I thought I had already attained. Yes. I, I was Laodicean. Yes. I was the on fire youth pastor guy going to Kansas City. Yes. And totally Laodicean. Yes. Because I had no idea that I was poor, miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. I needed him. Yeah, it's it's the book of Job that wrecked me. And it's because God really shows up in the late 20s. And he, and he pretty much asked Job 100 questions with the same answer. <laughs> I mean, the answer to the 100 questions that God, God shows up in a tornado. He shows up in a whirlwind. And he says, prepare yourself like a man. Gird yourself. Gird yourself. I will question you. And God puts Job, all of his friends, everybody, and the whole earth on trial saying, were you there when I did Genesis 1? Were you there when I told proud waves they can come this far and no more? Were you there when I hung the earth on nothing? He goes, do you know about constellations and galaxies out there? Big Bear, Little Bear, Orion, and all her little cubs. And then God talks about constellations and galaxies. Then he talks about the smallest, most minutest details of creation. Do you know the mating season of the deer? Do you know small amoebas in the bottom of the ocean? Do you send lightning in the middle of the desert just because? Now, what is God doing? He is blowing our mind. 
And 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 I think this is there is such a uh, a latent offense yes. and accusation in the heart of the majority of believers. There's a latent offense, and of even God's leadership, personal leadership, in our families, yes. in our nation, how He governs the earth, how He governs the earth. And the first thing you got to understand is you are dealing with the Genesis one God who's upholding galaxies and then taking care of the most smallest, most minutest details of creation and upholding all of it by the word of his power. And he's not like us. That's exactly right. He's not like us. His ways are not like our ways. And that's we do exactly what the children of Israel did of old. We make him like us. We make a God in our own image and likeness. And because of that, we languish. That's exactly right. Because of that, we stay barren. We actually create a figment of our own imagination. We worship that as if it's God. And that's what Tozer said, right? When that, the, the essence of idolatry yes. is creating an image of God and worshiping that image that's not like him, worshiping it as if it is God. Yes. And he said, that's the most important thing there is about you, what you think about God. The essence, this is what he said. He goes, don't fall in your pride of thinking that idolatry is just bowing down to images. Yes, it's that. But the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God yes. that are unworthy of unworthy him. Unworthy of him. The entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. And I believe we've made a God in our own image. Yeah. I believe we formed one according to our liking, one that's all about us, and one that's all that has been so watered down, so domesticated, and that we've watered him down. And I that's why I love starting with Job and getting punched in the face. <laughs> I'm like, God, it hit me in the face. I've been preaching this message for 20 years because of the, you can't even talk about going somewhere because until people, it's blind people that cry out to see. Yes. <laughs> and there's a poverty of spirit that must strike you to even take you into this journey. And the Job, and this is what Job says by the time the Lord was done. There's actually a halftime show in it. The <laughs> Lord gives it to him, punches, punches, punches. He goes, I've heard of you by the, it, it, what he did. Yep. He goes, I put my hand over my mouth, my mouth to the dust. Yep. And then the Lord gives him a, a second half and the Lord punches him some more. And he goes, now I know you can do all things. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my I eyes see you. And so I believe that God wants, this is an hour. Which is what? The spirit of revelation came in a way that enlightened his eyes so yes. he could perceive the reality of who God was. Go ahead. This is the hour. God wants to just blow and it's time to expand our view of God. Yes. You can't even feel the weight of the incarnation. You can't feel the weight of the person of Jesus Christ, of the power of the phrase, the word oh, was made flesh. flesh. The eternal, omnipotent, infinite, immutable, transcendent God who knows no bounds, who knows no lengths, who, has, who inhabits eternity. He is the one from everlasting. He is transcendent in his holiness, in his awesomeness, and friend, when you begin to touch the majesty of God, that begins to expose you. It begins to shine the light on how small you are, how small your opinions are, how, how trifling your, uh, your Facebook comments are, how trifling all of our debating circles so are. Much. And it makes and it produces the Isaiah 40 spirit. Well, that's what Job did. I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. But it's the all flesh is grass. Yes. It's all yes. fading away, but yes. his word stands forever. When you just begin to even a little bit expound truths of his attributes, that he is from everlasting, <laughs> which is what Elihu was hitting on. Yes. You can't count his numbers, number of his years. He's from everlasting. He's from forever. He's from forever. Let's I want to take an episode on. I mean, my God. He's from forever. He's never not been. He's never not been. Do you, do you understand the vastness of him? And then, and then it's what you're saying. Then we get to see how petty we've become. And this is, this is my grand concern for us right now, that we lack the knowledge of God. And so we have the knowledge of man. We are so aware of ourselves, so self-aware, right. so aware Goodness. of our surroundings, what, what we want, what, we, what pleasures us, what pleases us, what we're into, what we need. We're so in tune with us, 
we lack perspective of the heavenly. We lack perspective of the transcendent. And because we lack understanding and perspective of the transcendent, we languish. We live so low. And there's so much more for us. What could happen if a people would actually get the right knowledge of God, actually have the right motivation, actually have the right sight, see Him as He is, and then begin to declare Him into the situations of the earth, declare Him into our politics, into our society, into social media, my gosh all our little <laughs> arguments are so small and he is so vast and, and what we tend to imagine is we, we take our little petty problem and we pin it on God and say see he cares about this too and I'm telling you he does not care about the stuff we care about <laughs> he is serious about his son's glory yeah. he's serious about the earth coming to the knowledge of his name he says the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. He goes, my, my knowledge will transcend the entire atmosphere of this globe. Every nation will bow down to my son. He's got the name that's above every name. And somewhere in this season, we're going to go through this point, how the name, the glory, the knowledge, the attributes, how they're all one thing. That's who he is and what he's offered us. He, he, he gives us so many grand blessings, but he's what he's really offered us is himself. Yes. That yes. they would know me. And the phrase that was in my mind when I woke up this morning, the stork knows her season. Jeremiah eight, even the stork knows her season, but my people don't know my ways. And I just feel so gripped with that. And I don't mean to overuse the title, but I'm so <laughs> touched with how much we have to know him, yes. how deeply we have to get into this place of our own recognition of our own poverty. And that's where it starts, isn't it? Yeah. Behold, our God is great and we don't know him. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm risking with you right now. Would you dare to believe that you do not know God? Because if you can't swallow that, you this whole season is going to be hard for you. Absolutely, absolutely. But not. if you'll if you'll stand at that precipice and go, wait a minute, I don't know this. I don't know this vast expanse that's God. I don't know who He is, what He thinks, what He's like, what His ways are, what His attributes are. I don't know Him. Let me just propose this to you: If He is infinite, if He is infinite in all of His attributes, how could we possibly have attained? The knowledge of him by now we're looking through a veil through flesh through time and he is from forever we have not even begun we haven't even begun friends you're never going to get used to him he is going to be blowing your mind forever with fresh discoveries of himself that's that whole reality there's another burden that i have for this specific uh season there are there are forerunner messengers yeah that God is raising up in the earth right now. And the message is going to speak to such a higher place. It's going to be the thunders of the majesty of God, of the beauty of God, the Isaiah 40 messengers, messages that speak to hearts and that can stabilize hearts in the midst of storms. Yes, Comfort, comfort, my people, that will stabilize the remnant of Israel in her darkest hour. He says this, he says, what shall I cry? What's my message? What will be the forerunner's message? He goes, this is the forerunner's job. You confront all the futility, all the vanity, all the frivolousness, all flesh is, is grass. grass. It's beauty, it's loveliness is fading. As the flower of the field, the call of forerunner messengers is to step out of eternity and to bring eternity into the temporal to expose it. It's not about just going on, on, on a witch hunt on every little, no. it's releasing eternity. And when a little bit of eternity begins to touch it, everyone gets exposed. Yes. We bring eternity to bear upon time. Yes. And what happens is the temporal begins to bend to the realities of the heavenly. That's what the forerunner messenger does. That's what happens with Elihu. He speaks the word of the Lord and heaven breaks in upon his message. And when we're saying forerunner messenger, let's just be really, really clear. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about preparing the way of the Lord. And I want to say this really clearly. 
The two greatest days the planet has ever seen are directly in front of us. And those two great days are going to be the two greatest days of tumult and, and I mean, terrible <laughs> in, intervention of heaven that the earth has ever seen. There's a massive global revival coming. It is going to overthrow every power base. It's going to overthrow every throne of iniquity. It's going to stand in the face of every false god, and it's going to declare the knowledge of God right into the face of every idol. And there's power that is going to rush forth on the earth. We are going to see a billion souls come in a harvest across the earth. And it is going to be offensive. It is going to be so confrontative. You're going to see many who actually name the name of Christ offended with the onslaught of heaven that's coming. Yes, yes. That day is coming. Massive global harvest is coming. And the return of the Lord Jesus is yes. coming. These two days. When Jesus returns, he will overthrow the thrones of all nations. Yes. At the same time, there's global harvest. At the same time, God is going to be bringing a tumult upon the nations, judging the unrighteousness of the earth and setting up the context for his son's impending reign. When we say forerunner messenger, we're talking about day of the Lord preachers who are preparing the earth for the onslaught of the knowledge of God in revival and the return of the Lord. <sighs> yes. <laughs> so I just want to end. Welcome to season one. <laughs> season two. Season two. <laughs> it's season two. Just open up your hands right now. I want to ask. We're going to begin this season by the awareness, God, we don't know you like we thought we knew you. Crack all of our Crack Jesus. all of our little religious ideas, all of our ceilings. Jesus. Crack through all our little boxes. Break through all our nice little religious ideas. Crack it open. Crack it open. Release the spirit of revelation. God, I pray right now that you would expose, that you would awaken, that you would cut us, God, that you would show us that we don't know you like we thought we knew you. God, I pray that what you did to Job, you would do to us. God, what you did, what you did. Oh, Lord, John 9, Jesus says, I came into this world to shut the eyes of the ones who see and to open the eyes of the blind. <laughs> He's always opening up the ones who long to see more. God, I pray that you would release that spirit of revelation. And over this whole season, God, I pray for humility, poverty of spirit, reality, and that the currency of reality would bring forth salve. And that you would bring forth a church on fire and that you would raise up messengers from this uh, from this uh, season, God, and that you would mark us deeply. Yes, God. Lord, I confess, like Elihu, I confess you are great. Oh. And I don't know you, God. Oh. I want to know you, though, Abba. I want to know you. Yes. I want to plumb the depths of you, God. I'm not looking for just one little touch. I want to go deep into the knowledge of you. I want to plumb the depths of you. I want to know your ways, your thoughts, the way you think, what your opinions are. I want to understand your word, God. I'm not just looking for some shallow prophetic experience. I want your word dwelling richly within me. God, I'm asking for every single person that's connecting to this, this episode right now that you would rest on them with the spirit of revelation, that the preacher on the inside, the Holy Spirit, would begin to declare the truth of the knowledge of God, begin to call us out of our Laodicean ways, call us into revelation, the spirit of of wisdom yes. and revelation yes. in the knowledge yes. of Jesus Christ. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened. Yes. That we would know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. And Jesus, I want to tell you, I need you right now. I need you like air. I need you like the blood that flows through my very veins. Hey! I need you, Jesus. And I'm asking God that you would break something upon us that would shift us and get us out of our petty arguments, our low living, our low vision, and get us a vision for widespread revelation of the knowledge of God, the breaking in of heaven. Upon us, your people. Lord, release the spirit of revelation, we ask.
We give you thanks, Lord. We love you. Do it, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.